Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I hope that you all had some uh, good night's sleep. And yes, great. And a decent breakfast. Yes, excellent. So you are full of energy and ready to open the third EuroSci ASOSI joint conference, Emerging Issues and Emergency Situations, Israel 2019. It is my great honor to invite your host, the head of SAI Israel, State Comptroller and Ombudsman, Judge Joseph Shapira, to officially open the conference and convey his welcome greetings. Judge Shapira. Good morning, everybody. Are you tired? Dancing all night? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Milosav Kala, first uh, Vice President of your SAI and President of SAI Czech Republic. Mr. Juan Xientian, Chairman, I announced it, pronounce it well, of uh, ASOSAI and Deputy Auditor General of SAI Vietnam, Secretary General of the EUROSAI and President of SAI of Spain, Maria Jose de la Puenta, y de la Cañe, right? <laughs> Distinguished colleagues, Shalom and Bruchim Abaim, welcome. I am proud to open the third Eurosai Asosai Joint Conference, EIES 2019, here in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, the holy city, where I was born and raised, and that I, I love so much. I would like to thank you for the lovely gift you gave me. The conference is held not only in my home city, but also on my seventh and last year as State Controller of Israel and Ombudsman. My term in office will end on my 74th birthday. It is also the 70th year anniversary of Sai Israel. You know that in Jewish tradition, the number seven is a lucky number so this conference is in perfect timing. As you all know, the theme for uh, this conference, oops, um, is uh, emerging issues and emergency situations. Indeed, today's world is going through rapid and radical changes, aging population, digitalization, big data, cyber threat, and challenges of the future workforce. In the Talmud, one of the most important Jewish sacred text, it is written in Hebrew, which means, who is called wise, he that uh, foresees coming events. We, as size, have to imperative duty to audit and to examine our nation's readiness to deal with the different aspects of today's emergency issues and emergency situations. Therefore, we must respond quickly 
and to make sure we remain updated, relevant, and effective. This conference is a great opportunity to do so and prepare ourselves for the future. Going through the conference's detailed program, I read the dis dis descriptions of the various workshops and lectures carefully. The topics and issues raised are fascinating and the program is rich and unique and this is good for the opportunity to thank all of you who contributed a workshop, a presentation, a speech of the conference's program. I hope to see you all participate actively in the planned events and take active part in the discussions. This joint conference with rep representatives from different regions gives, gives us a unique opportunity to meet, to share knowledge and opinions, and to promote interregional cooperation. Use this opportunity, that's what we are here for. Thank you very much, and I wish us all fruitful and inspiring conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Next, please allow me to invite Mr. Miloslav Kala, first Vice President of Eurosci and President of Sci Czech Republic to convey his opening remarks on behalf of Eurosci. Your Excellency, <clears throat> Mr. President Josef Shapira, Your Excellency Vice Mr. President Tien Doan, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and mostly dear friends. I am really glad that we have met here today at the occasion of the third joint conference of Eurosci and Asosci. Let me give kind regards to all of you on behalf of Eurosci and our members. I have to apologize, my friend, Mr. Bash, president of Eurosci, who is not able to be with us due to the parliamentary sessions and upcoming local elections in his country. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers our Israeli colleagues, and in particular, the President Shapira. Our task today is to discuss emerging issues and emerging situations. We, the representatives of our countries who are professionally involved in auditing, have been dealing with emerging issues since ever. Let's have a look at what was necessary a hundred years ago. How did the infrastructure for the first cars look like, which were replacing horse carriages in transport? And what about sewage and waste systems in big cities? And do you remember the flu was a very serious illness and its epidemic was a serious emerging issue. And imagine that apple at that time was an apple. <laughs> what has actually changed for the auditors in the past 100 years? We have been addressing the same grand challenges and issues that affect each of us, our citizens, and actually the whole mankind. And 
as well as 100 years ago, issues relating to the development of transport infrastructure, the management of waste and supply of medicines and medical treatments are still emerging issues that we have to tackle. But what about cybersecurity, terrorism or migration? And what about the environment issues such as droughts, lack of drinking water, air pollution and ocean pollution caused by our waste? Are these really new problems or are they new just partially? Let me express my first hypothesis that our assembly could address emerging issues and emerging situations are old problems in the new codes. They often have a new quality. The role of the state's defense no longer lies so much in the defense of the border against tank attacks but it has been shifted, for example, to the defense of critical infrastructure against terrorist attacks carried out by individuals. The defense against fake news is not addressed by establishing a ministry of censorship and spies no longer write their messages in invisible ink, invisible ink and do not swap them in deserted cemeteries. Also, they often have a different dimensions, different quantity. Immigration, flows of millions of people, floods of cars in cities, or huge production of plastic waste ending up in the wet oceans. The answer to the first hypothesis could show us in what the role of Supreme Audit institutions has changed. If mankind faces new quality and size of its problems, the capacity of governments to respond to these challenges needs to change as well. And it is our responsibility to deliver reli reliable information and recommendations to our citizens parliaments and governments. However, is it the same information or is their quality or quantity to be transformed? Here, let me set up the second hypothesis. Size must be able to react to emerging issues and emerging situations entirely with new practices. Changing codes is not enough. Our assembly has a unique opportunity to look at what kind of procedures this could be. First of all, it's worth pointing out that the world is more connected than ever. And many of these topics, whether we like it or not, do not know borders. Our answer is, that we are here to cooperate, to inspire each other, to share data and information. These are principles which are essentials for both EUROSAI and ASOSAI strategy goals. This is our vital answer to emerging issues. It's good to keep in mind that our work is based on audits and audit reports. Words put down in them can change a great deal. Let's share our results. Let's enrich each other. The better our work will be, the fewer problems the world will have. That's why Eurosci has set up an interactive web, web page of Eurosci operational plan. That's why we publish individual projects. That's why we are working on a project for sharing information that can be used by all audit institutions for international comparison. 
and last but not least, that's why we run a database of audits where you can find almost 2,000 audits on various topics. Eurosci and Asosci, and in particular, our members work on interesting issues and we now have the opportunity to learn from each other. I am not going to formulate the third hypothesis as the answer is obvious. Together, we are stronger. Together, we can face new challenges more effectively. And thanks to our cooperation, the world can be a better place to live in. And apples could be more fresh. I wish you an inspired conference, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Kala. And now for our opening remarks on behalf of ASOSAI, please allow me to invite Mr. Dan Son Tien, Chair of ASOSAI and Deputy Auditor General of SAI Vietnam. Kính thưa Ngài, Du Joseph Sapira, Tổng Kiểm Đoán Nước, Israel. Kính thưa Ngài, Min Noblap Kana, Chủ tịch Kiểm Đoán Nước, Cộng Hòa Xét, Phó Chủ tịch thứ nhất của Urosai. Kính thưa toàn thể các quý vị và khách quý, lời đầu tiên thay mặt cho Tổng Kiểm Toán Nhà Nước Việt Nam, Tiến sĩ Hồ Đức Phước, Chủ tịch Arosai, vì bận công việc không tham dự hội nghị này. Tôi xin trân trọng gửi lời cảm ơn chân thành tới Ngài Yusuzef Sapira, Tổng Việt nước Israel và các quý đồng nghiệp tại Israel và các quý vị đại biểu đã đăng cai tổ chức hội nghị chung Asosai Urosai lần này và đã dành sự đón tiếp nồng hậu cho đoàn đại biểu kiểm toán nước Việt Nam chúng tôi. Thưa quý vị, kiểm toán nhà nước Việt Nam rất vinh dự khi lần đầu tiên tham dự hội nghị chung Asosai Urosai trên cương vị là chủ tịch của Asosai nhiệm kỳ 2018. 2021. Nhân cơ hội này cho phép tôi được bày tỏ sự biết ơn sâu sắc tới tất cả các quý vị vì đã đặt niềm tin và trao cho kiểm toán nước Việt Nam chúng tôi vai trò lãnh đạo Asosai. Đồng thời, kiểm toán nước Việt Nam cũng mong muốn trong nhiệm kỳ chủ tịch 3 năm sắp tới sẽ thúc đẩy nhiều hoạt động hợp tác, chia sẻ kiến thức hơn nữa giữa hai tổ chức Asosai và Urosai trong khuôn khổ biên bản ghi nhớ năm 2011 sẽ góp phần vào sự phát triển chung của cộng đồng kiểm toán công khu vực và trên thế giới. Thưa quý vị, Hội nghị chung Asosai Urosai là diễn đàn được tổ chức định kỳ nhằm thúc đẩy mạnh mẽ hơn nữa hợp tác phát triển giữa hai nhóm làm việc khu vực của Intosai. Trong đó, mục tiêu trọng tâm là tăng cường trao đổi, chia sẻ kinh nghiệm và thông lệ tốt về chủ đề chuyên môn được các bên quan tâm và tìm kiếm những phương pháp, kỹ thuật, kiểm toán mới tiên tiến hướng tới giải pháp hữu hiệu 
giải quyết những thách thức chung trong khu vực và toàn cầu. Tôi cho rằng chủ đề những vấn đề mới nổi và tình trạng báo động tại hội nghị chung lần thứ ba này đã thể hiện quyết tâm của hai tổ chức Asosai và Urosai trong việc khẳng định vai trò của cơ quan kiểm toán tối cao trong quản trị tốt nhất ở cấp quốc gia và trên thế giới. Trong bối cảnh các nước nâng cao hợp tác để cùng giải quyết vấn đề toàn cầu như biến động về chính trị dẫn đến những thách thức về di cư dân và nhập cư, thảm họa thiên nhiên của cách mạng dữ liệu số dẫn đến những rủi ro về an ninh mạng và thực hiện các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững trong chương trình nghị sự của Liên Hợp Quốc đến 2030. Các cơ quan kiểm toán tối cao của chúng ta cần phải xây dựng chiến lược và phát triển các phương thức tiếp cận, kỹ thuật kiểm toán tiên tiến nhằm đảm bảo các quốc gia sẵn sàng giải quyết những thách thức nói trên. Một trong những vấn đề trọng tâm mà ASOSAI chúng tôi quan tâm giải quyết trong thời gian tới là kiểm toán môi trường và thực hiện các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững của quốc gia và khu vực. Đây cũng là mục tiêu và cam kết mạnh mẽ của cộng đồng ASOSAI đối với mỗi quốc gia thành viên của khu vực và thế giới được nêu trong tuyên bố Hà Nội đã thông qua tại Đại hội ASOSAI lần thứ 14 tổ chức vào tháng 9 năm 2018 tại Hà Nội, Việt Nam. Tại hội nghị này, Kiểm toán Nhà nước Việt Nam cũng vinh dự được chia sẻ một số kinh nghiệm của chúng tôi về kiểm toán động và kiểm toán môi trường và kiểm toán việc thực hiện các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững. Tôi tin tưởng rằng tại diễn đàn đa phương này, Kiểm toán Nhà nước Việt Nam cũng như tất cả các bạn đồng nghiệp có mặt tại đây đến từ Asosai, Urosai, là cơ hội quý báu được trao đổi, chia sẻ, học hỏi những kinh nghiệm, kiến thức và thông lệ tốt nhất. Từ đó có thể làm phong phú thêm các phương pháp tiếp cận và thực hiện kiểm toán, các vấn đề mới nổi, những thách thức ngày càng trở lên phức tạp và đáng quan ngại, không còn là vấn đề nội bộ của bất kỳ một quốc gia nào. Đồng thời là cơ sở để Asosai và Urosai nói chung và các cơ quan kiểm toán tối cao thành viên nói riêng tiếp tục hoàn thiện các giải pháp đối với những vấn đề được quan tâm. Thưa quý vị, trên tinh thần như đó, tôi xin kính chúc hội nghị thành công tốt đẹp. Chúc quý vị đại biểu sức khỏe, hạnh phúc và thành đạt. Xin trân trọng cảm ơn. Thank you very much, Deputy Auditor General Duan. And now we move on to our first keynote speaker of the conference, Professor Eugene Kendall. Professor Eugene Kendall is the CEO of the Startup Nation Central, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the strengthening of Israel's innovation ecosystem and connecting the world business, government, and NGO leaders to the people and technologies in Israel that can help them solve their most pressing problems. Between 2009 and 2015, Professor Kandel served as the head of the National Economic Council and as economic advisor to Prime Minister and played a central role in all the major decisions on economic policy. Professor Kandel is a professor of economics and finance at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He will speak with us about the changes of the global technology-driven economy, 
Please welcome Professor Eugene Kandel. Wow. Um, so all the 44 excellencies, uh, good morning, welcome to our country. Uh, I feel safe already by knowing that you're going to discuss uh, sort of the preparedness of all of our countries to emergencies because uh, we, we do have many of them. Uh, uh, so good luck and uh, please uh, do a good job. So I was asked <clears throat> to talk about the challenges of global technology-driven economy. And uh, uh, I'm going to take you to a, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. I'm just going to try to package it into a set of insights that hopefully will be somewhat uh, novel to you. Uh, before I start, uh, so we'll skip that. Before I start, I want to talk to you about innovation. Uh, and I, I, I tend to partition innovation into two types. One type of innovation is a more traditional innovation where you gradually, this is how the humanity evolved. You partition, uh, you, you basically um, learn to do things better. So you constantly improve on what you do and how you do it, and you improve the quality and the quantity of both of, uh, of the product that you, that you produce with the existing resources. Now that, um, that environment, is usually stable and it's based on large accumulated knowledge. Now knowledge in our times is accumulated within organizations, usually large organizations. So not surprisingly, the much of this type of innovation is done within corporate world. Large corporates that accumulate knowledge over dozens of hundreds of years in some cases and they continuously improve. But there's another type of innovation. I mean, basically, all industrial nations evolved in this way. There's another type of innovation. This is innovation where the conditions are completely different. The, the knowledge is no longer stable, and the conditions are constantly changing. So this innovation is not really needed in a stable environment, but it's crucial in an environment which is constantly changing. Now, I can give you an example where nature actually uses these two types of innovation. Think about how uh, we procreate. Everything on Earth that is alive procreates in other two ways, either an asexual uh, replication or a sexual replication. Now, asexual replication is actually the type 1 innovation because you constantly improve and you make yourself, as a species, the, uh, into the best fit into your current environment. Okay, you basically control the entire environment because you're the best fitted for it. The problem is that the entire, almost entire natural, natural world is not using this type of innovation. I mean, we see almost all of our species that we see are uh, procreating through sexual, uh, sexual uh, reproduction because uh, of a simple reason, the conditions are not always stable. And if your species are the best fit to the current conditions, when conditions change, this entire species dies because they no longer fit for the new conditions. And so that's why the adaptivity to the changing conditions is something that survived over time. Okay, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to refer to these two types of innovation because actually the world is rapidly moving into the second type. The first type has been uh, with a world in which the knowledge was stable and the environment was stable. You were, um, the, the vice chairman was uh, talking to us about Apple. Just that little device that we all have in our pockets have changed completely the conditions that we do things and put a whole bunch of companies, whether they were in that business or in other businesses, out of business. So that, that's just a, just a small example. I mean, and the apple that he showed that was sitting here didn't do that. The apple evolved over hundreds and hundreds of years of better breeding, and you know, we still eat apples. So that's, uh, that's sort of the preface of, of this story. So let, let's talk a little bit about the global trends. Some of the challenges that we're going to be, you're going to be facing in these discussions today stem from these challenges. So there are five challenges that I would like to talk about. So the first challenge is um, uh, 
is the challenge of a post-crisis. We're 10 years after the crisis, but we're still in the post-crisis economy. Just look at these two numbers. These are numbers of 300 years of data of interest rates of the Bank of England. Okay, now the, uh, this is actually typo, it's not to 2015 and 2018, and the average over time was about 4%. These are nominal interest rates. This basically is the, one of the most important numbers in the economy. This is basically the cost of borrowing. So anytime you want to do something that has significant investment today and then returns over time, this number determines whether you're going to do it or not. So you can see that the average over time is about 4%. Then we had the lowest that we went. The highest that we went was 12% in the, in the um, 1980s. Uh, the lowest before the recent times was 2% during the World War II. Now, we were, we now on the upswing. If we were looking at 2015, it was 0.2%. So it's 10 times lower than the previous lowest, over 300 years. Now, this is completely uncharted territory. We don't know how to survive in this because zero nominal interest rate is actually a barrier. And the minute the uh, central banks get to that barrier, they actually all the theory that we have developed over the last hundred years doesn't work. So that's the uh, first one. On top of that, we have accumulated enormous amounts of debt. Okay, the amount of debt to GDP of developing countries now is at its highest level after post-World War II. But the difference between those two events is that post-World War II, the, the, the Debt was high, but it wasn't that high. The reason it was so high is a relative to GDP because GDP collapsed. And so when GDP picked up into the 50s, the debt to GDP ratio re declined very, very fast. Today, we have the same levels of GDP, uh, debt to GDP ratio. Unfortunately, the reason that we have that is not because the GDP collapsed, but because we actually piled up a whole uh, huge amounts of debt. Now, if you are a family and you have significant debts, how can you, how can you, what, what can you do? Well, you can either reduce the consumption or you can take another job. So you can have high growth. So the comparable in the economy is that the growth, basically the growth of the economy reduces the debt as a ratio of, of, of the total GDP. Unfortunately, we observe that the uh, growth or the additional income that the country generates is actually been half of what it was in the previous 30 years. And it's projected to be still half. So the growth is very slow. So we're not going to, uh, we're not going to reduce uh, the debt through, through high growth. Unlike families, uh, countries can another, have another tool to reduce debt they can inflate it out. They basically can print money and uh, create inflation. The inflation kills the debt in, terms, in real terms. Well, that's not going to happen, right? Because I just showed you that the interest rates, we don't see any signs of inflation in the near future. So, so that is uh, not going to be uh, the solution. So how are we going to repay the debt? The old fashioned way, we're going to repay the debt by uh, basically consuming less. But if you consume less, what does that happen? What happens on the level of the country? The country's economy grows less. So you basically, in the, in, the, in the cycle that we don't really know how to get out of, because never in our modern history we had a combination of high debt, very low interest rates, and very low growth. How do you get out of this? We don't know. Second, the second trend is the aging of the population. This is what's called the dependency ratio. So this is the number, uh, these bars are the number of people aged 20 to 64, so people in uh, working age, even though today the definitions of working age should change, over people, uh, relative to people over 65. So if you look at China, it has 10 people in working age supporting one person over working age. In Europe, uh, we have about three and a half. 
in, uh, in Israel we have five and a half and in the US also almost five and a half. But the difference is what's gonna happen over the next 10 years. Uh, sorry, o over the next 40 years. This is 1990. You see a big difference in, 19, in 2010. And the biggest difference is in 2030. Mm -hmm. So suddenly uh, China moves from 9.3 to 3.8. This is an enormous change. You have to understand that this means that if we don't have a savings-based system of pensions, that means that these four people will have to support one person instead of 10 people supporting one person. Okay, that's a huge change. And that's just the beginning because everything that, that the, the economy, the, the reason, by the way, for this is twofold. One is longevity has been increasing quite dramatically. The second is the fertility in these countries is declining. And Israel, the fact that Israel is declining relatively slowly is because in the OECD we are the, one of the highest fertility rates uh, in, uh, in, uh, in developed countries. But still, even then, we're declining from 5.5 to 3.8. Everything that we have to, we, we're going to have to change a lot of stuff to accommodate this tsunami. This is literally tsunami. Never in the modern history or ancient history, we had so many people over 65 that were alive. There's some numbers, I don't know, I haven't checked whether this is true, but some numbers uh, indicate that there are more people over 65 alive today that were ever alive in cumulative over the entire human history. Because people tend to, to die by that age. Uh, so this is a big unknown again. We're in a completely uncharted territory. The third part is actually, apart from the, what goes on in the economy as, as, as a whole, there is a shift. We get the, um, the um, center of gravity of the world economy used to be in the Middle East, because that's where the economy started. Then it actually shifted east, because there were big economies of China and India. Then, with the development of Europe and the United States, it started shifting west, and today it's shifting east again. We're, it's roughly today in the Middle East again. Not because we're big, but because we're sort of in the middle. So this means, uh, and the reason that it moves east is that we are witnessing an unprecedented move of people from poverty to the middle class. China alone, in the two decades, uh, moved 300 million people from poverty to middle class. I mean, and this is just the beginning. There are countries around uh, in, the, in, the, in the Far East uh, that are doing similar things. 300 million people, just to give you to illustrate, it's Western Europe. Okay, so we just created a middle class, Western size of Western Europe, which actually wants to consume and live like middle class in Western Europe. They want to consume many things, including food and clothing and cars and uh, air conditions, etc. And that requires energy, water, air, land, and we are com completely, um, uh, we are competing for these resources with the rest of the world. Okay, before their consumption was completely different, today they're consuming in similar way. And the biggest scarce resource in the world is actually skilled people, because the population and the economy are growing much faster than we are um, preparing uh, skilled people that can um, that can work on, on creating solutions. So that is one of the biggest competitions is actually on skilled labor. Again, we are in uncharted territory in that sense. I mean, never in the human history the changes of that, uh, of that uh, magnitude uh, happened. Additional one, and uh, the, the previous speakers mentioned some of that, um, it actually, responding to climate change is the, is the trend. It's not the climate change itself because we don't really know what it's gonna do to us, but we do know that we have, the, 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 the world economy woke up with a hangover and decided to start taking some medicine. And this medicine going to have side effects. And these side effects are going to change the way we do things, okay? Whether we're going to, it's going to make certain activities much more expensive, and certain, um, certain activities um, perhaps prohibitively expensive. So again, this is all completely new territory. 
And finally, the biggest one of all is the world of technology, which is going to generate huge changes, which we still don't know uh, to what extent. Now, just to give you some indication, this is 2005. Most of us at the age which was like yesterday. Uh, and we are in 2020, which just grew from 130 uh, gigabytes of, of information collected worldwide to 40,000. And we're just the beginning of the hockey stick. Okay? Now, this is just the first part. The second part is that we learned to process this information, make decisions based on this processing at an incredible speed. Okay? Which, in many cases, either far exceeds human capabilities or gets close to human capabilities. Okay, there is a, there is a uh, ability today of vision, basically 95% of human capabilities on uh, just regular activities, and in many cases much exceeding human capabilities. Hearing, the same thing. Speech recognition, the same thing. We are very, very close basically to replacing human with a robot. And all this creates an enormous change in our economy in every part of it, from cars to law enforcement to your jobs, everything is going to change. This is perhaps the biggest, the biggest change of all. Again, completely new. So think about the following. Each one of these five is a complete terra incognita for us because we've never done that. People learn by experience. We don't have experience in this, in either one of those, Indefinitely not an experience with all five together. So we basically going to through a change, and I'm reminding you the, the first slide about the two types of innovation. We basically going to have our life as a continuous and rapid change, which is scary, disruptive, but unfortunately inevitable. So we might as well get comfortable with it. Uh, every aspect of our life, education, health, defense, transportation, welfare, finance, urban planning, anything, will undergo uh, massive changes. And if we don't change, whoever does not change, whether it's a person, an organization, a firm, or a government, or a country, will lose. Because that's the, that's the beauty of, of change. If you don't adapt, that's what happened to a lot of species. So um, the problem is uh, that business as usual, the way we used to live until very recently, no longer cuts it. You have to become strategically flexible. Okay? The way that, that, that things are going to change, you have to become strategic on one hand, but very flexible on the other. It's difficult. It's not something that we've learned or we, we know how to do. And, but type two innovation skills are a must for individuals, businesses, and governments in order to compete and to basically not, not let their citizens uh, down. However, many times governments refuse to acknowledge that they're actually also in competition. But they are. Even though the government as itself, not a political party, but the government is not competing with anybody in its own country. The government is, by mandate, is the monopoly. But unfortunately, their country is competing with other countries. And so you cannot live as a government in an idea that, you know, I, have, I can take time and nothing will happen. I will always be there. You may always be there, but your country may, may not. At the same time, countries, uh, governments are notoriously bad uh, in adopting uh, innovation because of very, very poor incentives. Three years ago, uh, uh, Joseph uh, and, and I, we were at, the, at a conference where we sort of launched a, an initiative, a government initiative, of how to bring innovation into the government. Because the government basically has walls around it which prevents innovation of coming in. It's, uh, there are many good reasons. It's not because the governments are bad. It's just because the governments are orderly and are afraid of, of public opinion. And so they say, well, you know, this uh, old uh, verb, um, proverb that nobody ever got fired by buying IBM? That's, uh, you know, take that on steroids and that's you gets the government. Okay, because that's nobody gets fired by doing something they've done yesterday. 
This is the antidote uh, to, to innovation. So the question is, to you, is how do you make sure that while you making sure that rules are enforced and things are done in an orderly way, you don't kill the innovation because that will be the kiss of death to your respective countries. And it's not something that is going to maybe happen. It's going to certainly happen because of the way of the, of the future. The other thing that, that this uh, technology is going to create is it's actually creating two separate economies. I give this, uh, this illustration of a, of a Zeppelin in the sky and, and the dark economy on the ground. Israel is the most advanced in that respect because the Zeppelin in, in Israel is the largest in percentage of the economy than any other country. And what it does, it basically separates into economy into two pieces. The one that is empowered by technology, that's the Zeppelin, and the one that is destroyed by the technology or harmed by the technology. This is the economy below. Because every two kids in the garage in that economy are trying to destroy a whole bunch of jobs in the bottom economy. And not because they mean, but because that's what it means to Im introduce new technology. Usually, it, it, what it does, it disrupts the way we've done things before, and usually that involves much fewer people than, than, than it, it, it needed before. So what that does is an interesting thing. First of all, it requires completely different skills and people and financing and regulation than, than the economy downstairs. It also uh, uh, very, very movable. That's why I think the metaphor of Zeppelin is appropriate. Because Zeppelin, you can basically pull it and it will float above another country. And many countries are pulling these Zeppelins in their directions. And there's a huge competition for these Zeppelin because I bring you back into the skilled, the shortage of skilled people. Every country has a shortage of skilled people by definition because if you have more skilled people, you're going to get more industry and more, more, uh, more Zeppelin economy. So this economy is very, very competed for by everyone. So they dictate their terms. And so you get, they get lower taxes, lower regulation, because if you don't do that, you're going to get stuck without that economy. And then what do you have? This is the only economy that knows how to adapt the new conditions. You have to teach the below economy to do that. That economy learned that basically by definition. If they're there, they know how to adapt to new conditions. That economy, those two economies create a significant inequality. It's a structural inequality. This is because these people generate enormous wealth. And these people don't. This is exponential economy. This is linear economy. And unfortunately, the standard tools of dealing with inequality don't work because that economy cannot be taxed severely in order to equate it with it because it's just going to move. Very, very easy to move. Basically, if we take Israeli, just an Israeli example, if we have 100,000 people moving, moving from, from Israel to other countries, specific people, we're going to be done with, with our economy with our Zeppelin economy, which is the largest in, in the world in terms of percentages. So um, this is yet another challenge, which again, we've never faced before. So uh, let me talk a little bit about, uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, sort of these challenges. I've already mentioned uh, a few. The people who will figure out the countries or the, 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 the countries may, mainly that will figure out how to live with all these challenges and the, these trends uh, will be the big winners. Uh, one of the things, by the way, which could be a very, very, very big use, and I think it's, the, it's the, one of the big dangers that you need to address, is that our lives are increasingly run by algorithms. And they will be increasing, much more increasingly run by al algorithms in basically any space, in your 
financial space, algorithm will tell you how to invest. In health space, algorithm will tell you what kind of, they will replace a whole bunch of activities by doctors. In transportation space, we have a company in Jerusalem that basically today you can sit in the, in, the, in the car and read a newspaper and it will tell you when it needs you to intervene. Okay, you can drive for, for 40 miles without, without touching your steering wheel. All of them are run by algorithms. How do you regulate algorithms? We have no idea. Because algorithm is not a person. The way we regulate people is we basically set certain rules and we tell the person, you go and make decisions, and then in the retrospect we'll decide whether you made the right decision or the wrong decision. This is not a way to regulate algorithms, right? Because you program the algorithm. There are two types of algorithms. There are those that you program and you know what they will do in every situation. Then the whole idea of judging the algorithm in retrospect doesn't make any sense because you knew in fr up front what it will do. But then these are simple algorithms. The complex algorithms that you have no idea what they will do because you just started them and then they learn on their own. Now, how do you regulate those? Will you come to them and say, well, you learned badly? So what do you mean I learned badly? I'm a computer. What do you want from me? You programmed me, I started learning, I got exposed to certain data, and that's, that's the outcome. We have to figure it out. You can't regulate them as you regulate humans. Just to give you, uh, I wanted to give you uh, an example of a system of how different the environment is. Uh, if you wanted to design an education system 100 years ago and today, how would you go about it? Now, nobody, of course, designs an education system from scratch. Education systems, as all big systems, have the inertia. But just imagine that somebody would land on, on, uh, from, from uh, Mars and design a new education system. You have stable, slowly advancing knowledge, which means that instructor that was trained once could teach it for many, many years. You don't need to retrain them. We are now in the environment where the knowledge is drastically and rapidly changing and making much of the previous knowledge irrelevant, so instructors have to be replaced or retrained all the time. Now, this is extremely inefficient. You can't retrain the instructors for, for two, three years. It just kills, kills the model. Uh, the old system was designed after the Industrial Revolution to educate people who needed to perform routine tasks, relatively simple and very predictable for the rest of their lives. So you could basically ask them to memorize a certain set of rules and, and, and um, material, and then go and perform these tasks. The difference is that today you need many people who are performing very complex tasks that you don't know what they are, and you, but you know for sure that they will change over their lifetime. So the memorization has no place in, the today's, in today's uh, education. The third thing is that we had only two ways of conveying information. You could either read it or you can talk about it. Okay, that was it. So you basically, frontal instruction plus some reading at home was an efficient way because you took one person and he talked or she talked to 30, 40 people. That's the most efficient way to convey information. Today we have dozens of ways of conveying information and, uh, so, um, and they are much less expensive than standing in front of an audience of 30 kids uh, and, 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 and speaking for 45 minutes. And finally, we had no way of evaluating somebody's knowledge apart from testing what they actually know, but we didn't really know what they've learned. So there was only one way through a test of content. The problem is that you tested for, of content, you will taught what you could test and not what you needed. Today, you, have, you can evaluate learning process in real time with big data for every person and it's basically almost a zero cost. So doing tests doesn't make any sense. Now, however, if you have children in, the, in, the, in school, most of their day-to-day -day life is driven by the system on the left and not the system on the right. 
Okay, so this is the challenge of changing a big system and you have the responsibility of thinking about this as one of the major emergencies because this is really, really important to do it quickly and well. And unfortunately, how do you actually do that in the context of vested interests that don't want that to change because they want an easier life? So if I scared you enough, uh, let me move to something, something else. I wanted to give you a little bit of taste of Israeli innovation. This is what I call my bragging slide. This just wants to impress you that the density of innovation in Israel is fairly high. Okay? So whether it's um, we are either number one uh, or number two, we are constantly competing with South Koreans, uh, on being number one or number two in terms of R&D spending as percentage of GDP. Whether we have by far the largest uh, number of startups per capita, whether we are in terms of number three in the uh, World Economic Forum Innovative Economy, but the, I think the most interesting number is actually on the bottom. We, uh, you know, you, you, when you read newspapers, you don't feel that Israel is the most stable in the most stable region or the most sort of uh, um, uh, place uh, that you have the most confidence uh, from investors. And yet, uh, worldwide investors in VC, venture capital, feel that Israel is number two after the United States in terms of their confidence in, in the ability of the country to generate interesting returns. And as a result, we obtain two and a half times more VC capital per, uh, per capita than the next highest, which is United States. Okay, so we're in a different, in a different uh, uh, dial code. So all this just tells you that there's something going on here, very, very dense. And the question is why? This is definitely was not predetermined. If you, when I came to this country, I was born in Moscow, Soviet Union, I came to this country in 1977, uh, and this was the biggest export of this country at that time was polished diamonds. As you probably know, we don't produce diamonds. So basically, we were importing the diamonds, polishing them, sending them back. Uh, and the next biggest export was uh, produce, especially Jaffa oranges, etc. So this is not, we are talking about 40 years. This is quite a metamorphosis. So it was definitely not predetermined. And so what I wanted to give you is a little bit of taste of why we have had this metamorphosis. Actually, going back, when you, if, I presume that you will have a little bit of touring uh, opportunities uh, going around the country. Every tree that you will see has been planted in the last hundred years. So think about this uh, space around us were basically, uh, especially when going towards Tel Aviv, this was all sand uh, with swamps with malaria, very little trees. The country was deforested completely between the 6th century and the 20th century. And it is the only country that reforested, actually, in the world. Uh, so imagine all that, very little water, very little arable land, not the most hospitable community, you know, no apple pies meeting you, and you are coming here from uh, uh, all over the world into these completely different conditions of, uh, that you have no idea how to adapt to them. Okay, if you were coming from a village in Ukraine, or from a village in Morocco, or from a town in Iraq, or from uh, Western Europe, and hundreds of thousands of people started coming here, None of them knew how to live in this space. So they faced literally existential needs. And uh, I sometimes joke that when they came, they had their own SDGs. These were survival development goals. Because if they didn't meet those goals, they would not have survived. We would not be sitting here. The country wouldn't have existed. Okay, so we are in a good scenario. Looking back, there were many scenarios which, you know, we happen to have chosen or, or awarded a very good one. So how do you address existential needs in an environment that is completely new to you? This is the type two innovation. Well, um, it turns out uh, the Jewish people had 2,000 years of training to be prepared for this. 
Not that we chose this boot camp for 2,000 years. It was sort of imposed on us, but it was a good boot camp. Well, it was good in a sense that those who survived it, and only about 4% of the population survived it, um, became pretty well adaptable to any new situation. Just throw them in, and they figure out how to survive. Because without it, we would not exist. So that led to innovative solutions. I'll just give you one example. And this, by the way, these so the innovative solutions were not necessarily technology. This was a combination of things. Let me give you um, uh, an example. In 1928, the British government, which used to rule here, written a report uh, based on the work of their best engineers that said that if you take Jordan River and take all the area to the west of Jordan River, uh, it could, this water basin could support no more than two million people. Okay? It, you know, there's no reason to think that, that this was fabricated report and uh, people don't, didn't claim that. So in the next uh, 90 years, two things happened. One is that precipitation in this country declined by 50 percent, okay, relative to 1928, which would imply that you could support fewer than two million people. And at this stage, the basin, the, the same water basin supports about 14 million people, including the water that we, we give Jordan according to our peace agreement with them. And in addition, we also export a lot of water and fruits, vegetables, wines, etc., to the rest of the world. So we, we're talking about less than two, 14. These are not small changes. How do you do that? Well, in fact, and this is um, an interesting thing because uh, if you compare 1970 consumption of water per capita to, 90, to today, it declined by 70%. This is at the time when the GDP per capita in this country increased quite dramatically. In 1970, we were a poor provincial country. Today, we're one of the top 25 countries in the world in terms of GDP per capita. So your water consumption per capita should increase, not decline. We declined by 70%. How? Well, we had to figure out because otherwise we wouldn't be able to live here. So this was a combination of many things. I'll tell you what they are. Education of people to save water. Uh, control of water, central control of water. So the country allocates water on a national basis. Three public-private partnership to develop and invest in water. Four, um, pricing of water is done well. So on the margin, you price at the real cost of water, unlike in many places. Five, desalination. We have one of the best desalination technologies, which we started developing in the 60s. By the way, United States was our partner in that. Um, six, we drip irrigate. We invented drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is about 60% more efficient. And in Israel, um, uh, drip irrigation is uh, used on 94% of the cr irrigated crops. The average in the world is 3%. Okay, again, this is not that we are so smart. We just couldn't live here otherwise. And the final one, we reclaim 85% of the municipal water. So when I take a shower, I can afford to take a longer shower because I know that 85% of it is going to go to agriculture. Now, just for comparison, the next country in the world that reclaims the highest amount of water is Spain with 24%. Okay, we're 85, 24, United States reclaims 1.5%. Okay, now this is, of course, when you're rich in water, you don't really need to do it. But you can understand that existential needs if you are able to innovate on a variety of, of uh, verticals, you can actually do wonders. We, today, we basically, in, as citizens in, uh, in cities, we're independent of nature for our water. Because we, we, even if there's a severe drought, we're not going to run out of water. So that was the first stage of Israeli innovation. It was very early, and it continued into well into 60s, 70s, and 80s. In the 50s, the second stage came when we realized that our problems uh, are some other people's problems as well. And so our solutions that we developed for ourselves could be utilized in other places. And so we started 
collaborating with other countries on sharing and co-developing solutions. So that was uh, uh, the second stage when we became more global. But the most interesting stage is actually the last 30 years. Because all this was the siloed solutions. So you had a water silo, you had an agriculture silo, you had defense silo, medical silo. What happened since is that we created so many solutions in the silos, this story is spilling over relative to our needs, connecting between different solutions and reaching other markets. So understanding that the solutions that we developed can be used in different applications of what we originally intended. The biggest supplier of that is, is the military. And so we now, in a, in a developing a very, very wide range of solutions, that we don't have problems of that nature. Or the, at least the problems that, uh, that we face are too small to develop these industries. So these, so these uh, solutions are developed for the world from, from scratch. Whether we're talking about digital health, precision agriculture, industry, industrial IoT, IoT uh, um, enterprise software, etc. All these are not developed for Israeli market. It's too small. It's all developed to address um, other solutions, uh, sorry, other problems, and therefore it's extremely important for us to actually have a continuous dialogue with other countries and other um, entities, corporates, etc., to actually figure out what their challenges are so we can work with them to figure out together the, the, uh, the solution. Now the biggest question is, is what makes us more innovative, more densely innovative than others, why, uh, why here? And there are five components that each one of them plays a role. One of them is the culture, I've already mentioned it. It's an extremely different culture than in majority of countries because it developed under different conditions. Very, very non-hierarchical. Uh, basically, the entire country calls the prime minister by his nickname. Uh, it's, um, and basically there's no hierarchy accepted by, by anybody. It's very, uh, very straightforward, goal-oriented. So sometimes if you meet Israelis, they strike you sometimes as rude. They're not rude. They just, within their culture, they're just very, very direct. They will tell you exactly what they think about what you just said. They're not there to offend you. They're just there to tell you what they think that you just said. Um, it takes some time uh, to, to, to get uh, acquainted uh, or to, to, to get used to it. There's a variety of other features of the culture that I'm not going to mention, but they all could be somewhat annoying on one-to-one -one interactions, but they're extremely well suited for innovation, overconfidence being one of them. The second piece here is IDF. IDF is Israeli Defense Force. It's, uh, it's quite a unique army in the following sense. Again, this is innovation that was developed. This, this army was created in 1948. It's one of the very few armies in the world that actually doesn't have two, two castes, okay? It, usually the military have the soldiers and the officers, and they come into the military from two different places and through two different paths. In Israel, everybody goes through the, through the same path. So you know that the officer, they're basically telling you to crawl on the floor, went through the same path two years ago, and the uh, chief of staff of the, of the military went through that path 25 or 30 years ago. So it's, it makes the military much more democratic. In Second thing, it's a very non-hierarchical military. You call your commanding officer by their first name. Nobody salutes here. Nobody marches. It's, it's basically a very casual army. Uh, and the third thing is that um, uh, you should see an Israeli parade. It's, uh, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty fun. I mean, I grew up in, in, in Russia. I know we parade when I see one. So um, it, it was pretty funny to, to, to see that. Um, but, uh, but it's actually positive, because you don't waste a lot of time on, on learning how to march. Uh, this, the third very interesting thing, this is quite unique, is that 
this military actually produces technology. Some militaries around the world, all militaries around the world use technologies. Some militaries around the world produce technology in the sense that they have defense industries that produce technologies which military defines. So Raytheons and, uh, and uh, uh, Thales and, and other companies, large companies that work around the military, they produce the technology. We also have those, but in Israel we also have soldiers that produce technology. So think about the military. We have a draft in the country. So you basically take, at the age 16, a uh, majority of the population is screened once, then screened again, then screened again, and you basically create a pyramid of abilities and various skills that the military knows about you. Then they ask you, what would you like to do in the military? And then they also bring the needs. And so the combination of what you want to do, what the military needs, and your skills creates a combination, and then you are placed much better into the military. So if you're placed in a non-technological unit, you learn the leadership skills, you learn responsibility, you learn to appreciate that you can actually do much more than you thought you could. That's one thing that I got out of the military, is that my, my capability is much bigger than, than what I thought. But then you put people into technology units. So these are 18 year olds, okay? You take them and you train them between six months and a year, let's say in computers. And then you give them tasks that usually people in their mid 30s are given. But these people are only there for three, four years. So you can't wait until they are 35. So you basically mix them with the more seasoned people and you start asking them to really work on problems as equals. So there could be a colonel and a private, 18, 19 year old, and they on the same level in terms of their, uh, their discussion. And so that uh, creates a set of highly trained, highly motivated, highly experienced and extremely overconfident people that are coming out of the military at the age of 21 to 22 and are thrown into the market every year because the military can't keep them all. So you can understand that these people is the core, in addition to universities, this is the core that brings a lot of technologies and a lot of innovation into the military, into the world, because they cannot continue doing what they were doing in the military with their technology, so they're looking for other things. Immigration is a great thing for innovation. Many different opinions mixed and create new, new things. Government, in this case, was very good in innovating and even better in not doing things that it wasn't supposed to do. This is even harder because that's, by the way, you know, the question that you always ask, why didn't you do this? In this case, it was good that they didn't do this. So that's a, that's a lesson that we have to all learn that in many cases, government should not get involved if it, doesn't, it can't improve. And of course, we had a lot of luck. This is a good thing, you know, uh, but um, luck without other components is not, is not enough. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't move. There is, this, uh, there is a, this is all looks very good, but remember I showed you the, the, um, the Zeppelin and the, the downstairs economy? Israel is at the forefront of that in the terms of the size of the Zeppelin as a percentage of GDP, and you can see that in terms of inequality. We're creating that inequality, the salaries in the sector, in the Zeppelin sector relative to the downstairs sector, are by far the highest anywhere in the world because the sector is so big. This is something that everyone should look at this picture because it's coming to the theater near you. Okay? It's definitely coming, unless you're going to forego the Zeppelin economy and say, I don't want them. I just, I just gonna which is going to tax them, and whatever, whoever stays, stays. It's not really an option, but you can try. Uh, this is something you need to deal with. And uh, the last thing I wanted to tell you, just 30 seconds about the organization that I lead. Um, this is a nonprofit organization that was inspired by this book, The Startup Nation. And it basically, its aim is the following. We are here to promote Israeli innovation as a source of good solutions to 
some of the world's biggest challenges. In collaboration, we cannot do it alone. We need collaboration with many countries uh, because the challenges that we have are too small to really develop an industry and the solutions that we have uh, created have a potential to really address lots of, uh, lots of different existential needs, uh, the SDGs as in their today's meaning. So uh, if you, uh, we do three things basically. We create knowledge and insights out of that knowledge. We have websites that you could uh, all go and, and, and look at. Uh, nothing, uh, we, we charge for, no, for anything, we don't charge for anything we do, so it's all free. Uh, we connect um, uh, the ecosystem to the world, especially to the world problems. One way of connecting to us is uh, what's called Startup Nation Finder. It's an innovation platform that allows you to basically understand what goes on in any area of, of technology in Israel including academic, including investors, etc. Be, uh, also in the field that may be relevant for you, like GovTech. Uh, we, and finally, uh, we bring here uh, large corporates, governments, and NGOs to connect them. We work with them to create as much value for them as possible. And we connect the ecosystem to Israel because, think of this Zeppelin, we definitely want to strengthen the the uh, ropes that attach it to Israel. We don't want to see it in any of your countries. You have to develop one of your own. Thank you very much.